What's up, Bridge City Church family? Pastor John here with you uh, to preach the word of the Lord. You know, uh, excited to, to be getting ready for the Easter holiday season. And as we're transitioning out of our Unless the Lord Builds the House series and getting ready for our Passion Week and our resurrection uh, messages, uh, we just have an awesome opportunity to preach what we like to call a standalone message. And today I'd like to dive into something that I think no matter who you are, it's going to apply directly to you. Because I'm a big believer that uh, no matter who you are, where you live, what's going on around you, you are in one of three phases in life. You are either in the middle of a storm, you're on your way into a storm, or you're on your way out of a storm. That's right. Even though the water may be clear and the sailing might be great right now, the reality is we live in a fallen world world. And one of the things that I struggle with myself, and it's so hard to see other people, especially followers of Jesus, deal with, is when things in our lives, whether it's struggles, difficulties, hardship, or pain, doesn't line up with the blessed and abundant life that we know we have in Jesus. And we have an enemy who is trying to do everything that he can to get us frustrated, flustered, and fearful and so today I want to talk about how do we respond? What do we do when it seems like everything is falling down? And I want to uh, preach out of a uh, very favorite passage of scripture for myself personally, 1 Samuel chapter 30. And so we see here in the life of David that, that David is in a place where he has been faithful to the call of God on his life. And rather than compromise his calling, compromise his character, he has been living on the run from King Saul, who was not only his, his, his friend and his mentor, but King Saul is the king whom David is anointed by God to replace. But rather than take his calling and God's promises into his own hands, David has committed himself to not lay his hand on the Lord's anointed. That's right. David, even though he knows that he's called to be the next king of Israel, he is not going to take his calling into his own hands and eradicate Saul, even though King Saul is doing everything in his power to eradicate David. And so we see David in a place that he never thought he would be here in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Because if you're not familiar with uh, the book of 1 Samuel, we see in chapter 27 of 1 Samuel that David, because he's just wore out and tired and just, just, he's just ready to give up. And rather than keep running, he actually goes and joins the Philistines who were Israel's arch enemy. Now, I don't know about you, but there's always a temptation as we're waiting on the promises of God to just give up and start hanging out with the enemy. And my hope is today that there's some principles you're going to get from this text that we're going to read in 1 Samuel 30. They're going to help you to not only endure and maintain in difficult seasons, but also to find the grace, also to find the peace to know that even if you have given up, even if you have found yourself uh, uh, being around the enemies of God, that God, through his love and through the restoration that's only found in Jesus Christ, he's calling you back home and wants to give you a pathway to not only get out of the trouble that you're in, but to maintain and persevere so that you can walk in and fulfill the promise that he has for your life. And so we're going to start reading here in 1 Samuel chapter 30, and I'm going to start with just the first part of the first verse. And it says in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1, it says, Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day. Now there's a couple of things that I want to help set this message up. Ziklag is the town that was given to David and his 600 fighting men and all of their families by the king of Philistia, whom David is now in the service of. That's right. 
Davis is, David is serving the king of the enemy of the people of God. I don't know if you've ever been there in your life where you're just ready to give yourself over to the enemy because of frustration or fear or doubt. But here we see David himself, the man that the Lord says is a man after my own heart. The, the man that says he is the apple of God's eye. We see him embedded with the enemy. And we see David and his men, they're actually coming up to Ziklag because they had been going out to battle with the Philistine army in chapter 28 of 1 Samuel. And because the Philistine leaders didn't trust David, namely because in Israel they sang songs about David killing thousands of Philistines, they went to the king and said, hey, look, king, we don't trust this guy. We don't know what's going to happen in the heat of battle. He might just start turning on us and killing us, and we want you to send him home. And so even though the Philistine king didn't have any problem with David, he listens to his leaders and he says, hey, David, I like you a lot, but you know what, buddy? I need you to go home. So we see David being sent home from work, essentially, because his co-workers don't like him and they don't trust him. And so after this three day journey, we see David arriving at the city that belongs to him and his men at Ziklag. Now, I want you to understand that there is a significance to the third day. The third day is very significant in the Bible. Obviously, the, the biggest one is Jesus rose from the grave on the third day. I mean, that's an amazing, amazing truth. But when you look throughout the Bible, you see several other significant things that happen on the third day. We see that Abraham, back in Genesis 22, when he's taking his son Isaac to sacrifice him to the Lord, he's obeying the word of the Lord, that Abraham, right before he kills his son Isaac, and the Lord speaks to him and says, no, don't kill your son, Abraham finds a ram in the bushes on the third day. We see that Jesus performed his first miracle, according to John chapter 2, verse 1, on the third day. We see that after Israel was, was released from captivity in Egypt and they've passed through the Red Sea, that God meets with them and speaks to them as a whole nation for the very first time at Mount Sinai on the third day. And we see that Queen Esther went in to petition for her people to the king of Persia, on the third day. And so before we move on, I want you to understand something here because this is going to come into play later on. The third day is significant because in the Bible, the third day indicates an act of divine intervention and restoration. That's right. God moves on the third day. And I want to encourage you because sometimes we fail to see the divine intervention and restoration of the third day because a lot of times we give up on day one or day two. We just don't persevere, we just give in. But I wanna encourage you, hold on, because your third day is coming. Let's keep reading here in 1 Samuel chapter 30, picking up the second part of verse number one. And it says that the Amalekites, that's a, 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 a nation of people, a group of people. They had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. So what we're seeing here is that there was these bands of, uh, of roving marauders who would go all around the countryside to just rape and pillage and plunder and steal and destroy. And this group, the Amalekites, had made a raid against David's hometown of Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, which in and of itself is a miracle of God, but carried them off and went their own way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. I can't even imagine it. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. So I don't know if you've been in a place where you've had to ugly cry, but this is where David and his men, that's right, not just men, but manly men, warrior men, trained killer assassin battle-hardened men are so moved and so distraught by the situation that they encounter when they return home that they cry so much until they had no more strength to weep. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I've been there a few times in my life. 
Verse 5, it says, David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because all of the people were bitter in soul, each for his own sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd be willing to wager that some of you have probably had a bad day or two in your life. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a really bad day. I don't know if you've ever had an Alexander's terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. But the day that we see David and his men experiencing is far beyond any kind of day that I have ever had. But one of the things that we have to understand is that suffering is always relative. And so whether the suffering that you're experiencing is the loss of a job, the loss of a loved one, maybe it's the loss of a family pet. Maybe you're just in a place of despair or fear or whatever the case may be. Suffering is relative, so it doesn't matter how bad your day is, but I want us to understand that the day that David was experiencing here was a bad enough day to make anyone want to give up, to make anyone want to just throw in the towel, to make anyone just want to stop, because here's what David is dealing with. First, like I said, he's been sent home by his boss because his co-workers don't like him and don't trust him. And you know what? If you know about the history of David, David throughout his life always uh, wrestled with what we call in the church a, a rejection scheme. He had been rejected by his dad and rejected by his brothers and rejected by his mom and rejected by so many people. And this is something that the enemy had always tried to use to tear him down and pull him away from the promise of, of God on his life and the call of God on his life. And so he's spending three days wrestling with this rejection scheme. Even his own king, King Saul, rejected him. And upon returning home, he finds not only his home ransacked, but his whole neighborhood is burned to the ground. His wife, his wives and the, his children have been kidnapped and taken by slaves. So I don't know about you. I want you to picture this for a minute. Imagine the thought of someone kidnapping your loved ones, especially small children, and you don't know what kind of horrible things they're doing to your loved ones. That's where David is. And on top of all of that, his closest friends... These are the men that he leads, but these are also some of his closest friends that have gone through so many hardships with him. They've seen the Lord win so many victories in his life, and that's why they follow David. But here, this moment is so bad that his closest friends, his support system, if you will, are talking about killing him. I don't know if you've ever been there, and I hope that you've never been, but no matter what kind of hardships you've been through, I can, I can tell you this. It's probably not been as bad as this, but whatever it's been, we've all been in a situation where it's difficult. And so the question that I have for us today is, what do you do when everything falls down? How do you respond? I believe here in the text, we see a couple of things of how to respond. Because like I said at the outset of the message, you're either in a storm, on your way into a storm, or coming out of a storm. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, that in this world, you will have trouble. But he finished that verse by saying, but fear not, for I have overcome the world. So how do we overcome in him? What are some things that we can do in our, in, in, in our own lives to put into practice so that we're not crippled when hard times come? Well, the first thing that we see David doing is David had a default setting. You know, uh, all of our devices and computers, they all come with what they call a factory setting or a default setting. And when something goes wrong in those devices, they go back to that default setting. They go back to square one. And I believe that each and every one of us as people, we all have a default setting. And so when difficulties comes, the reality of it is we all go back to our default setting. And, and maybe your default setting is anger. Maybe your default setting is despair. Maybe your default setting is just apathy or indifference. You just, you just don't care. But all of us have a default setting. And here we see that not only did David, but in contrast to David, his men also had a default setting. 
Because we see that his men, they were bitter in soul. Now that's significant because that phrase appears way back in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 2, when David meets these people for the first time. It says, and everyone who was in distress, this is David, he's now on the run. He's hiding out in a cave called the cave of Adullam, and he's there by himself. And it says, and everyone else who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul, gathered to him, and he became commander over them. And so we see that in the face of difficulty, David's men went to their default setting. Their default setting, bitter in soul. But David defaulted to his default setting, and we see it in verse 6. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Psalm 27, verse 4 and verse 8 David says this, One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Verse 8 of Psalm 27, You have said, Seek my face. My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, do I seek. So we see that while David's men, their default setting in the face of difficulty and strife and pain was to be bitter in soul, David didn't go that route because David had already built in a different default setting in his life. And David's default setting was to strengthen himself in the Lord. And that leads to the second thing that I believe this text shows us of how to respond. First, we've got to have a good default setting. We're going to talk about how we have a default setting at the end of the message. But the second thing that we need to practice in the midst of difficulty and pain and strife and when the world's all coming against us is something that I like to call soul control. That's right, soul control. I believe that as human beings, we are three-part beings. We are physical, we are body, we are spiritual, we are spirit, and then we have the place within us where our opinions, our emotions, our thoughts, our ideas, our ego, all of these things reside not in our spirit and not in our body, but in our soul. And our spirit is the part of us that's justified the moment we believe in Jesus Christ. Our body is the thing that will eventually die, but we're going to get a glorified body in heaven when Jesus returns. But the soul part of us is the part of us that needs to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. But we have a part to play with the Holy Spirit in keeping our soul under control. That's right. You can control your emotions. You can control your thoughts. And even if you're not able to in your own strength, which I don't believe anybody really is, the Bible says that we have been given divine weapons, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, where we can bring all of our thoughts and make them subject to Jesus Christ, that we can tear down lofty opinions and ideas that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. And so no matter where you are, you have the opportunity and the responsibility to bring your soul into control. And so in order to strengthen ourselves in the Lord, we have to practice soul control. Now, for some of you, that might be quoting scripture. That might be praying. And I'm even going to go the next step and say praying in tongues. That's right. Your heavenly prayer language. First Corinthians 14, 4 says that we, we edify ourselves when we pray in tongues. Jude, uh, verse 20, because Jude only has one chapter. It says that we build ourselves up in our most holy faith when we pray in the Holy Spirit. Another way to practice soul control is to enter into worship and praise. That's right. You don't have to wait for Sunday morning to get your praise on. You can throw on Pandora or YouTube or Spotify or whatever music streaming service. Maybe you still got CDs or 8-tracks or whatever you need to do, but begin to start worshiping and enter the presence of God. Being in a corporate gathering, whether it's a connection group or coffee with uh, other believers or within the worship experience on Sunday, these are all ways that we can begin to learn how to control our soul. And I believe that at this moment, as David's men are off in the corner, they're, 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 they've, they've cried until they can't cry no more. 
And now they're like, we're going to kill him. We're going to stone him to death. And while they were bitter in soul, I believe that David just began to start personally just quoting scripture. I believe that at this moment, I have no proof to back it up, that David just started quoting over himself. Or maybe even it was at this moment that the Holy Spirit inspired in him Psalm 103. And I believe that David just began to start saying, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Sometimes you got to talk to your soul. He said, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And he just began to start telling his emotions who his God was rather than allowing his emotions to go and make his God look little. David practiced soul control. And so when you're in the midst of a battle, when you're in the midst of a storm, when you're in the midst of a hardship or a difficulty, don't just sit off by the side and take it. Don't just lay down and let the enemy kick you. You rise up to your feet and you strengthen yourself in the Lord your God and you practice soul control and you begin to start blessing the Lord your God. We need to stop shouting at our problems or about our problems and we need to start shouting unto the Lord. Amen. So the story goes on and it says in verse number seven that and David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod, this this wonderful uh, garment of the high priest. Only the high priest of Israel was allowed to wear it. I'd love to get into this, but we don't have time. But he said, bring me the ephod. And one of the ephod's primary responsibilities was containing the breastplate of God, with, which held the Urim and the Thummim, which is a way that people would inquire of the Lord or find out what God uh, wanted them to do. And so he says, Bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David and David inquired of the Lord. And he said to the Lord, shall I pursue after this band and shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered David, pursue for you shall surely overtake them. And then watch this and you shall surely rescue. That's right. David not only got the answer to his question, but he got a promise to stand on. That's a good word right there. And so after strengthening himself in the Lord, David goes and he begins to start seeking the Lord. And that's an important thing to remember because a lot of times what we like to do is we start seeking the Lord while our soul is still in turmoil. But Philippians chapter four, verse six says, don't be anxious about anything, but instead of being anxious, pray. So it's not get anxious and then pray. It's stop being anxious, practice soul control and then pray. And the promise there in Philippians chapter four, verse six is found in verse seven because it says, and then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Man, what a fantastic promise. But nevertheless, after we have gotten our soul under control and strengthened ourselves in the Lord, now we need to seek God and say, God, what do I need to do in the midst of this situation? Because God has an answer for you. And so David not only got the answer, but he got a promise to stand on. He said, yes, go ahead and pursue them and overtake them. Oh, and by the way, you're going to be successful. And I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but I believe some of you, you just need to hear that from God right now. In the midst of this difficulty, you go ahead and do what God is calling you to do. And don't you worry, because God is going to make you successful in this endeavor. But the best part of this is found in verses 11 through 15. So let's jump down to 11 through 15 here in 1 Samuel 30. Because David, he's getting ready. He gets his guys. He's like, hey, guys, don't kill me. God's going to give us victory. But now we have to pursue. See, sometimes you're waiting for God to do something, but God is waiting for you to do something after you've heard from him and gotten instruction. And so in verse number 11 of 1 Samuel 30, it says that as they're out chasing these Amalekites, it says they found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David. So this Egyptian guy, he's just kind of out in the wilderness by himself. They find this guy, they bring him to David and they gave him bread and he ate. They gave him water to drink and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit was revived. For he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. Verse 13, and David said to him, to whom do you belong and where are you from? And the Egyptian said, I am a man of Egypt, a servant of an Amalekite 
and my master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. <laughs> we had made a raid against the Negev of the Cherethites and against that which belongs to Judah and against the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, will you take me down to this band? And the Egyptian said, swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this band. Now the story goes on, spoiler alert, David not only finds the Amalekites, he eradicates the Amalekites, and he finds all of their family members, all of their wives, all of their children, and all of their stuff well and intact, and all of the other stuff that the Amalekites had stolen from other places. So David and his men actually make out on this deal. But nevertheless, God gave them the victory. But the point I want us to get here as we begin to wrap this thing up is that while we're in the midst of a turmoil, while we're in the midst of the struggle, while we're in the midst of day one and day two, and we might not even know there's a problem there, but on the third day we find out there's a problem, we remember that the third day is a sign of divine intervention and divine restoration. And the thing that I love about this is because God had prepared the solution and the answer for David before David even knew there was a problem. That's right. When, when David left the Philistines, it took him three days to get to Ziklag. And while he was on his way to Ziklag, this horrible thing was happening. But this Egyptian servant, this answer to David's prayer, that how are we going to do this? That answer was waiting for him before before David even knew the problem because God has a plan. He has an answer. He has a solution for you and you may not be able to see it. You may not be able to know it right now, but the third day is coming. God has a plan for you in the midst of your situation and even if you're not in a place of despair right now, even if you're like, hey man, things are pretty good. Everything's all right. When that moment of trouble comes, when that storm comes, not if, but when, I want you to go back to the scripture and and know that God is preparing an answer and a success before you even see the clouds on the horizon. God has a plan for your life. But for us, as we're facing these things, we have to put into practice the same things that David did here. Because it would have been real easy for David to say, Everything's gone. Nobody wants me. And everyone wants to kill me. He could have literally said all of those things. But he didn't. Because David had a solid default setting. He was able to maintain in the midst of the trial. Because his default setting wasn't bitterness. Wasn't anger wasn't rage, wasn't fear, it wasn't despair. It was trust in the Lord as God. And you know, it may be easier to get angry or to get fearful or to get in despair. But I want you to hear today, even if you're not a follower of Jesus yet, that God has you and he has a plan for your life. And you can trust him. And because David cultivated a deep, strong relationship with the Lord before the situation hit, he was able to rebound because he already had a good default setting. The second thing we need to do is we need to, we need to learn to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. I love it. David took it upon himself to practice soul control and to get his emotions under control and to strengthen himself in the Lord as God. And he didn't wait until he was in the midst of the storm to learn how to strengthen himself in the Lord as God. He practiced it because he had a good default setting. And that's the problem with a lot of people. It's too late to learn to swim when you're stranded in the middle of the ocean. You got to put these things into practice on the front end. You say, well, how do I strengthen myself in the Lord? Well, I gave you some of them and I'll give them to you again. Quote scripture, read scripture over your life, find promises in God's word and speak them over your life. Pray, and not just pray, but pray in the Holy Spirit, pray in tongues. And if you don't have that ability, then ask God for that gift. Praise, worship, 
Have a group of believers that can come and surround you with praise and prayer and quote scriptures over you. See, after we've learned to strengthen ourselves and after we've learned to have that default setting, then we need to seek the Lord and obey His direction. And I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're going through, but I believe that God is speaking to some of you right now. He has been speaking and you just haven't been listening or you've been listening and you haven't been obeying. And God has given you the answer. He's already prepared the answer before you need it. But now you need to obey. The Lord told David to pursue and David did it. He didn't wait for a second opinion or a confirmation. But before David could pursue what he wanted, he first had to pursue the Lord and seek his face. So right now, if you're, if you're someone that you've, you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've never sought his face for salvation, but you're in the midst of the storm, I just want to invite you right now to click on the link that's there on the screen and to reach out and someone will help you to make that decision and help you to understand what that decision sets in motion because it's not a one-time thing. But maybe you know the Lord and you're just, you just feel like you're alone, that every, nobody wants you, everything's gone, and everyone wants to kill you. I just want to encourage you to strengthen yourself in the Lord your God, to return to your default setting, to get in the Word, to get into worship, to get into prayer, to get around other believers to encourage you. And I want you to be reminded that no matter how hard it may seem, God already has the answer to your problem even before you knew you had it. May God bless you. Thanks for spending some time with us. We'll see you again soon.